Okay, can everybody hear me? Okay, thank you very much, Mary. And there is a handout. Does everybody have a copy of the handout? The handout has two sorts of things on it. One is a glossary of terms in the order in which I present them, not alphabetical order. And it also has a bibliography. So if there's a certain thing that catches your interest and you want to pursue it further, this will give you a good reading list. Okay, in China, from the mid uh, 18th to the mid 20th century, the production of inexpensive colored woodblock prints destined for the mass market was a flourishing business. These prints are known as Nianhua, or New Year's pictures. In reality, they depicted a wide variety of subjects for use not only at New Year's time, but also during the regular year. Important centers of woodblock print production were located throughout the country. Prime subjects for these woodblock prints were images of wealth gods, Zai Shan. Prints such as this one from Yang Liuqing near Tianjin express the hopes, especially voiced at New Year's time, for a prosperous New Year's. It includes the. Uh, Uh, here, uh, the civilian wealth god, he's usually identified with Bigang or less frequently with Fan Li. Bigang was a legendary figure from the late Shang dynasty, roughly 1500 to 1100 BC. He was cruelly killed by the tyrant ruler of the Shang at the request of the ruler's evil concubine because Bi remonstrated with the ruler for squandering money meant for the welfare of the people. In the 5th century BC, Fan Li served as a minister of the state of Ye and planned the scheme by which his master was enabled to reduce the rival state of Wu. The military wealth god, over here, um, is usually identified as Zhao Gongming. His history is very complicated, and I don't see any reason for repeating it here. Zhao wears armor and is often portrayed in the company of his black tiger. Now, just to explain further what it is we are looking at, these two wealth gods are surrounded with a plethora of wealth motifs. They stand in front of a five-part screen whose pillars and eaves are ornamented with round coins. You can see all these things here all along the eaves, the pillars, all these round coins. The central section here has a table in front of it on which is a massive vase holding gleaming treasures such as coins and round jewels. Suspended from the eaves are the shoe-shaped ingots and more coins. Below these are stacks of ingots known as ingot mountains. Large coins also appear in the two of the uh, side panels of the screen, and the outermost sections are decorated with uh, precious coral branches and costly nephrite leaves. Two more ingot mountains appear in the lower corners of the print. In the upper right and left, there are the so-called money trees, festooned with coins and strings of cash. To either side of the two gods stand these handmaidens who are offering symbols of wealth and treasure. In the lower center of the print, two youths hold on the left a coin, sorry, on the right a coin, and uh, on the left a branch of coral. In front of them uh, the, is the military wealth god's tiger, and on the right-hand side, a dragon belonging to the uh, civilian wealth god. The dragon is a so-called coin dragon because sections of its body are composed of coins. Both creatures spew cascades of coins and other treasures. So this is very specific and very elaborate evidence of the constant search in China for money. Now, wealth gods appear in many uh, in a wide variety of guises. The civilian wealth god is sometimes pictured with his wife. This print is in the University of Michigan Museum of Art, and it might have been posted in the home at New Year's time uh, along with ceremonies honoring the wealth god, or perhaps at other times during the year. Uh, they are seen with somebody who pours a cascade of wealth into a basin. 
By the late 19th century, numerous shrines devoted to wealth gods were found throughout China. Not only were there temples devoted to the two major wealth gods, the civilian and the military, but there was also a large number of subordinate gods to whom people could appeal for financial success. In one Beijing temple, a, a temple devoted to the two main wealth gods, there were also shrines to 18 secondary wealth gods. Lesser lights in the wealth god pantheon include the immortal official of recurring joy and profitable market. I think I've included the Chinese characters for his name on, on the handout. Uh, he is pictured in a print in the Wallenstein collection uh, in the Asian Art Museum in Berlin, which we see here. He's standing. He's holding a gray symbol of authority right here. And he is surrounded by a horse and two foreigners uh, who are bringing in vases of elephant ivory and rare gems and gleaming jewels, symbolizing undoubtedly a thriving commercial market for foreign luxury goods. Another lesser god is the increasing happiness and multiplying treasure wealth god. This is also in the Wallenstein collection in Berlin. In front of him is an altar on which there are two of these shoe-shaped uh, ingots. He is also attended by foreigners, this time holding branching coral and an elephant tusk. Below, the usual man pours, stream, pours a stream of jewels and coins into a basin. And there is also a stand uh, holding scales with which to measure the treasure. So there's a reasonable amount of literature on these and various other wealth deities. But one special wealth theme relating to the Chinese perpetual quest for riches has been largely ignored, and that is the theme of the living wealth gods, the Ho Tsai Shen. It is unknown when this theme entered the popular print inventory. In the popular print tradition, the living wealth god has three dimensions. The first is the depiction of what we must, just might consider a generic uh, anonymous uh, living wealth god. The second is uh, the connection between the anonymous living wealth god and the practice of counting the nines, or the nine, nine nines disperse the cold. The third is the representation of identifiable, fabulously wealthy people, some of whom uh, earned the designation of living wealth god. So my presentation explores the context and significance of these three categories. So we'll begin with the anonymous uh, living wealth gods. Here is an example from uh, Yang Jiabu. By the late 19th century, the generic anonymous living wealth god is pictured in prints as a man holding his Hu scepter. He's right here. Sometimes he holds a Rui scepter, um, symbolizing may you have all you wish for. And he's seated in a pavilion. Uh, he may be accompanied by his wife or an attendant. And as in the other prints, they are surrounded by wealth symbols, bowls of treasure, money trees uh, festooned with coins and shoe-shaped ingots, servants approaching, uh, bringing more evidence of affluence, or as in this illustration from Shandong province, little boys who collect the ingots, which are cast out of the money tree by two other little boys, and then deliver the packaged treasure to the anonymous living wealth god, as inscribed along the top, a living wealth god. There is no personal identification provided here, so that's a, this is just sort of a generic anonymous wealth god. So let's look uh, at counting the nines. The anonymous living wealth god is sometimes associated with a popular custom called counting the nines. This practice involves counting the 81 days between the winter solstice and the beginning of warm weather for planting, usually ending on New Year's Day, a total of nine nine-day periods. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this practice, let me sum summarize what goes on. A variety of images, complex or simple, were used. There might be just simply a chart with dots or there could be an elaborate picture, each one containing 81 blank spaces. 
as in the dots on the or that ornament the bibs of these pudgy little boys, nine little boys. Uh, this is a print from Wujiang in Kobe province. Beginning on the day of the winter solstice, a single dot would be filled in, and this would take place every day until the end of the season, concluding on New Year's Day. The text at the margin of this print claims, among other statements, that the children enjoy themselves even though they are not clothed in this winter season. It ends with wishes for attaining, among other things, three abundances, happiness, longevity, and promotion. The side panels indicate how to fill the 81 dots on the children's bibs. If the day was rainy, the top half of the circle was filled in. If the day was sunny, the bottom half of the circle was colored. But if it was a windy day, the left-hand side was darkened, and so on. Now, one of the earliest of these charts is preserved in the rubbing of a stone carving dated 1488, and it has a spray of plum blossoms in a vase in the center. There are a total of nine clusters of blossoms, and each cluster has nine petals, so that gives us a total of 81 blank spaces. In the parameter around the edges of the main panel, uh, there are nine landscapes documenting the climate changes of the cold season, ending in the 10th scene at the very bottom, and here's a detail. The, the plum blossoms, by the way, signify the end of winter because they bloom early in the year. The final panel, the one here at the bottom, of which we see an enlargement here, consists of three boys and a goat bearing a treasure basin, indicating that the arrival of the new year also brings wealth. This is a very elaborate pun. I'll only mention a little bit about it. The three boys are young. The three young refer to the Thai hexagram in the Book of Changes. I can't go into all of the details, but the resulting phrase is San Yang Kai Thai, and that refers to the new year uh, of renewal and refreshment and change of fortune and prosperity. So counting the nines is intimately tied to the wishes for wealth in the coming year. So now that we sort of understand what the counting the nines is, is about, let's see how this is connected with the living wealth gods. Uh, two prints from Yang Liuqing are prime examples. Both are set in courtyards of a well-to-do family, where the returning living wealth god is welcomed by family and household members, as well as wealth-bearing servants. This print is entitled, Turning Home, Returning Home Wealthy. The special phrase for use in counting the nines, containing nine characters, each having nine components, is inscribed in outline form on the wall, right here. It reads, Truly, a living wealth god arrives at our house. So beginning on the day of the winter solstice, one brush stroke of each character would be filled until the entire phrase was filled. A second print, also from Yang Yuqing, is entitled, Bringing in Wealth from the 18 Directions. Here, a parade of wealth bearers enters the courtyard. The expression for truly a living wealth god arrives at our house is emblazoned on the coins surrounding the main image, but that's not what is used for counting the nines. What's counting the nines is this sort of domino-like set of nine panels at the top, and I'll show you a detail. So the legend is here, but the, you fill in all of the blanks up here. So uh, let's turn now to the specific uh, living wealth gods, those that are known, we know who they are, what they did. And let's return to the first print that we looked at, where the civilian and military gods meet together. And earlier, I enumerated the plethora of money and wealth motifs. But there is more, because if this extraordinary display of wealth motifs is insufficient, part of the two wealth gods' retinues include two gentlemen, here and here, standing uh, just behind the money streams. And they are labeled as representing Shi Chong on the right and Shan Wan Shan uh, on the left, commonly referred to as Shan Wan San. These are two identifiable living wealth gods, and here they are in detail, Shi Chong and Shan Wan Shan. 
Now, in his survey of modern of, of wealth gods, the modern scholar Lu Wei devotes an entire chapter to living wealth gods. He includes Shi Chong, whom I've already mentioned, as well as the famous uh, Tsai Ching of 1047 to 1126, Shan Wan Shan, whom I just mentioned, along with the well-known Grand Secretary to the Ming Dynasty, Yan Song, 1480 to 1565, a Manchu official in the Salt Administration named Kang, Ang, Kang Dang Ah, 1755 to 1822, who was noted for his lavish dinner parties and his vast collection of art objects, and the so-called barefoot living wealth god, Yu Cha Qing. Yu was a wealthy Shanghai comprador from Ningbo. It is said he did not wear shoes. I can't confirm this. <laughs> in his survey, Lu, however, does not even mention the fact that some of these men were pictured in prints. And the reverse is also true. Not all of Lu's living wealth gods were immortalized uh, in prints, in popular prints. And indeed, of the six men presented by Lu, only Shi Chong and Shen Wan Shan, these are the six men presented by Lu, only Shi Chong and Shen Wan Shan. Um, are rendered uh, in popular prints. Now, some of the people honored in prints aren't even in Lu's list. For example, the 5th century Fan Li, whom I mentioned toward the beginning of this paper. Other affluent men rendered in popular prints include Kang Bai Wan and Yuan Jilan. Uh, Zilan. According to James Flath's findings, the late Qing Dynasty wealthy official Li Hongzhang, 1825, uh, 1823 to uh, 1901, quote, is referred to in certain Nianhua as a living god of wealth, end quote. Apparently, such prints have not survived. On the other hand, a Qing dynasty living god of wealth whose name is given in the print as uh, Wu Xue Du, but it's probably uh, the wrong character. It's probably meant to be uh, Xu Xue Yan. This, he's better known as Hu Guang Yong, uh, 1823 to 1885. He's the subject of another print. And in the 20th century, the peasant uh, Wu Manyo was designated as a living wealth god. <clears throat> now, basically, the known living wealth gods have different personal histories, and depictions of them generally reflect the specificities of each individual's life. But along with modifications so that the print would appeal to different levels of society. The prints thus aggrandize the grassroots conception of these celebrities and contribute to their enduring popularity. So we'll start out with Shi Chung. The representation of Shi Chung in the late 19th century print is perhaps, as far as I can tell, the only surviving image of him as a living wealth god. Shi Chung's family acquired prosperity through the iron trade in Henan province, and Shi himself expanded his personal assets. Shi was a talented writer and an able administrator who held many official posts. He owned the Gold Valley Garden, which boasted coral trees, and he owned the lovely concubine Green Pearl. His ostentatious display of fabulous opulence roused the jealousy of several powerful people who coveted his possessions and his beautiful concubine, Green Pearl. And so he became the victim of conspiracies. When Schur was sent off to be executed, Green Pearl threw herself from the upper story of a tower to uh, commit suicide out of loyalty to him. According to Helmut Wilhelm, Schur was, quote, probably the wealthiest man of his period, end quote. I find it very ironic that Shi Chung should be elevated as a living wealth god when it was wealth that brought him death. When he is shown in the civilian and military wealth gods meet together, he appears simply as a solitary, static figure in official garments. There is nothing to distinguish him from any other official figure if it were not for the label by his shoulder, there would be no way of knowing who was represented. So this is not a terribly um, interesting print, but it is one of uh, that allows us to talk a little bit about Shircho. Uh More interesting are the earliest extant woodblock print representations of another individual named, known for his wealth. They come from 18th century Suzhou. 
Here, Fan Li and Shen Wanshan were both honored with large prints. I mean, th these prints are about this big, depicting their lavish estates. In the Qing Dynasty, Suzhou, before it was sacked during the Taiping Rebellion in the mid 19th, uh, yeah, mid 19th century, was undoubtedly the wealthiest city in China. Direct visual records of Suzhou's wealth are preserved in painting and in print. Its riches are perhaps most famously chronicled in a long hand scroll uh, painted in 1757 by Xu Yao. Now, given the prosperity of the city, it is understandable that their artisans lauded affluence. And this is evident not only in prints of the commercial district, but also in a print that celebrates the wealth of a millionaire from ancient times, the fifth century Fan Li, who I mentioned uh, toward the beginning of the lecture and a couple other times. He is sometimes considered as a model or the civilian wealth god. He is pictured here in an elaborate Qing Dynasty Suzhou print titled Tao Chu's Wealth. It shows him in a pavilion presiding over a beautiful garden inhabited by many lovely ladies and happy children and even a horse stable visible clear back here in the distant confines of the estate. This mansion scene eloquently speaks to the owner's riches. Now, although Fan Li is not directly specified in, as a living wealth god, the implication of this lavish estate is clear and it is clear that he was recognized as a prosperous, well-off individual. Over 19 years, he accumulated multiple fortunes and twice gave them away to his poor friends and distant relatives. According to Sima Chen, the historian Sima Chen, who recorded Fan Li's biography in his chapter on wealthy people, quote, this is what is meant by a rich man who delights in practicing virtue, end quote. Fan Li became known as Lord uh, Zhu of Tao, Tao Zhu Gong. Tao Zhu Gong today is used in the sense of millionaire, so very wealthy person. Now, 18th century Suzhou prints, print artisans also produced prints depicting the mansion of Shen Wan Shan. So here we turn now to Shen Wan Shan. Now, Shen Wan Shan, although pictured as a docile figure in the civilian and military wealth, god meets, wealth gods meet together, actually was immensely appealing to the popular imagination. He became the subject of many legends and stories and even a cult figure. Now, there's a lot to tell you about Shen Wan Shan. I'm not going to tell you everything, but I'm going to give you uh, some sort of indication and inkling as to what goes on with his um, stories. So be patient while I re reveal some of his history before looking at some of the print representations of this wealthy man. Shen's real name was Shen Fu. The family uh, came, the family home was near Suzhou, and it's important to remember that Suzhou in sort of central China. He lived around 1360 and was considered one of the wealthiest men of his day. His wealth was inherited from his father, who supposedly possessed a huge tract of arable land. Shen may also have managed the estates of local uh, landowners, taking over their property as they abandoned it in. <coughs> Uh, to avoid uh, persecution during the popular uprisings at the end of the Yuan dynasty. Shani engaged in many other financial enterprises, such as grain transportation, as well as local and overseas trade. However, in the popular mind, these facts fade. And instead, the basic legend is that he was a poor fisherman who became rich after he found a basin in his fishing net. When his wife dropped her jewelry into it, the entire vessel was suddenly filled with jewels. Experiments with other objects had similar results. This basin is known as the treasure basin, the Zhu Bao Pan. In popular stories, Shun was asked by the first Ming emperor to contribute to the enlargement of the walls around Nanjing, paying, it is said, one third of the cost. Legend has it that the new Nanjing South Gate was named the Jewel Basin Gate because Shun's magical basin was buried under it by the emperor's order. Now, according to one uh, modern analysis, this quote provided that henceforth no subject in the empire, no person in the empire would be able to grow so rich as to rival the imperial house in wealth. And it is interesting to speculate how such a myth came to be generated. The gate in question 
opens on a view of the Jewel Basin Mountain, the name of this hill being current long before the rise of the Ming. Perhaps in the popular mind, the story was preserved for its symbolic significance, end quote. There are several variants on this magical basin story. And in one uh, variant, Shun obtained the magical container from the legendary Taoist, uh, Zhang Sanfan. And there is still another version of the story, and this is my favorite. One night, Shun dreamed that 100 men, all dressed in green, came to visit him and ask him to save their lives. The next morning, he saw a fisherman with over 100 frogs that were going to be killed for meat. He suddenly became aware of the import of the dream. He bought all the frogs and put them in a pond. Then the frogs croaked all night. When the day broke, Shun went there and saw an earthen pot with the frogs crowded in it. He took the pot home without paying much attention to it. One day, while his wife was washing her hands, she dropped a coin into the pot, and suddenly the pot was overflowing with coins. Shun tested the pot with gold and silver, and every time the result was the same. Thus, he became the most wealthy man in the country. I don't know what happened to the frogs. <laughs> now, apparently, because of his association with early Nanjing, Shun and his wonderful powers to produce money were appropriated and transformed by the mythologies surrounding uh, Liu Bo Wan, Liu Ji, uh, 1311 to 1375, and the planning of Beijing. In the 17th century, Shun's legendary life was the basis of an opera titled Treasure Basin. In the opening of this opera, Shun is a poor fisherman who saves uh, a member of the Dragon King's family and in gratitude is presented with the magic ball. In addition to fascinating the popular mind, Shun Wan Shan also attracted extensive attention among traditional Chinese compilers of interesting tidbits of data, factual or otherwise, as well as attracting the attention of modern scholars. The modern scholar Kok Lan, Kok Lan Chan, in his meticulously researched study of the many legends surrounding the planning of Beijing, has subjected the assortment of Shun Wan Shan fact and fiction to extensive analysis. Chan corrects several errors in Shun's biography and discusses many of the Shun Wan Shan legends relating to the shaping of the city of Beijing. Interestingly, uh, Chan discovered that Shun, in the form of a small, unpretentious ceramic sculpture, was enshrined as a living wealth god in the well-known Beijing Taoist temple, the Bayun Guan. Now, given Shun Wan Shan's multiple persona, it is not surprising that he is variously depicted in woodblock prints, although not all of these prints specif specifically designate him as a living wealth god. The implication of great wealth and his magical basin are always present. So the earliest known portrayals of Shen Wanshan are two mid-18th century prints from Suzhou. These, like that of Fan Li, are characterized by many figures in architectural settings and extensive detail. One, titled Shen Wan Shan uh, Zhu Bao Pan, shows him seated in the second story of a grand mansion, right here, uh, surrounded mostly by lovely ladies watching foreigners. You can barely see them down here. Offload a huge treasure, treasure, basin, treasure, treasure basin from a large junk, the lower left. This would suggest Shan's wealth originated in trade with the West. And I'm sorry, this is the best uh, image I can get. It's only reproduced in one place and in this somewhat fuzzy image. The second Suzhou print is simply titled Zhu Baopan. It's in the Muban collection in London. The main imagery shows Liu Hai and his uh, magical three-legged toad floating, floating on a cloud high up in the upper left. Liu Hai's personal history is extremely mixed. Suffice it to say that by the late Ming Dynasty, popular folklore endowed him with a magical, wealth-seeking three-legged toad that Liu Hai lured with a coin attached to a cord. Liu Hai pours a stream of riches past a dragon twisted uh, in a money tree, which in turn spews a huge cascade of monies and jewels into a gigantic treasure bowl. Right down here. Here represented by a large basin ornamented with three large circles containing the characters for treasure basin. I have other details of this. 
These are the multiple individuals uh, of, from foreign areas who bring in treasure as Shan Wan Shan watches from his pavilion. In the back rooms of his residence, assistants weigh and tally his money, and still more people bring in more goods and treasures. Now, Shan Wan Shan's treasure basin is not the first appearance of such a magical receptacle. There are earlier stories about bowls that magically replenished or expanded whatever was placed in them. Although Shan Wan Shan is intimately connected with the treasure basin story, and he's the person who is immediately named at the mention of such a bowl. The depictions of a jewel-filled container emitting glowing light appear much earlier than Shan Wan Shan's story. For example, there are two woodblock prints believed to date from the Yuan Dynasty. They are very close in form to, the, the basins are very close in form to those seen on later popular prints. Here we find a large bowl on the back of a camel coming in from the west. There is an elephant tusk on either side, and in the center is an array of coins and gems. On the outside of the bowl, there are three facets and three large circular designs, just as in later representations of this vessel. But let's move on. In the late 19th and early 20th century prints of Shan Wan Shan, they exploit aspects of his legends to appeal to various levels of Chinese society, from peasants to merchants. Shan Wan Shan prints from uh, Zhu Xianjian in Henan were for a rural audience, and one of these simple prints depicts him along with his wife, he's labeled right here, along with his wife and an attendant, a maid servant standing next to a treasure pot in which grows a huge money tree. Now, according to popular lore, both the money tree and the treasure basin replenish their riches, but the money tree produces only coins, whereas the treasure basin produces a variety of rarities depending upon what was placed in it. Uh, a print from another North China site, Yangjiabu in Shandong province, also in the Mubang collection in London, is extremely interesting because the poem at the top, sit along here, uh, identifies Shan as coming from Henan province, whereas we know very well that that gives him a North China origin, despite the fact that his family hailed from Suzhou in the south. Shan, as a rustic fisherman, is about to cast his net over the magic basin, right here, uh, which is uh, filled uh, with fish, coins, and ingots, and gems, with the, with the help of two water sprites under the direction of the uh, dragon king. His wife and two sons watch the proceedings. Evidently, the rural population appreciated son Shun being a fisherman whose story combined hard work with the in intervention of magical elements. Another important feature of Shan Wan Shan as a fisherman is that fish Yu is a homophone for Yu, abundance or plenty, a concept reinforced by the money tree with its heavily coin and ingot laden, laden branches above Shun's boat. Now, more uh, artistically sophisticated late 19th and early 20th century prints from Yang Liuqing presumably were directed to the urban uh, population, urban merchant population. They show Shun as an elegant, wealthy man surrounded sometimes by a few, sometimes by many uh, family members wearing lovely clothing. And the degree of the ostentation clothing, ostentatious clothing is also an indication of wealth. By this time, the lavish mansion setting used in the 18th century is passe. Instead, the artisan zooms in to focus on Shun, two ladies and three children, all gorgeously attired. One child plucks a spray of coins from a money tree, another plays in the treasure basin, and a third holds a huge ingot. Two coins in the treasure basin bear the character Guang, presumably referring to the reign era of Guangxu Emperor, um, who ruled from 1875 to 1908. This provides us with a terminus post quem date for this print. It must have been made after 1875. Another example from Liang Liuqing is simply titled, Shan Wan Shan Gets Rich, and it's a masterful display of the designer's ingenuity. 
in, ad in addition to the lovely ladies holding jade leaves or branches of coral and the like, and children pushing in or carrying containers of coins, everything, everything in Shen's courtyard is composed of money. Not only does the money tree blossom with its huge coins, over here, and we'll see, we'll see a detail of the section. So not only do we have all these huge coins in the money tree, but even the rocks, uh, the ornamental rocks, sprout ingots. The table is made out of coins, and one of these coins uh, carries the characters Xuantong Yuan Bao, a coin of the Xuantong era. Uh, Xuantong ruled from 1908 to 1911 again providing us with a specific date after which this print must have been designed. It must have been made after 1908. Now, if this adulation is not enough, Shen Wan Shan holds the primary position uh, among the three great living gods of wealth. In a print from Yang Jia Bu Shandong, instead of narrative emphasis that informs the story-oriented prints, this one echoes religious iconic symmetry. Shen Wan Shan is in the very center. He occupies the center god position and is flanked by two lesser living gods of wealth. Above in the position here, which might be occupied in a Buddhist image by Apsaras, two boys hold, two small boys hold lotuses, uh, homophones for continuous lian. And in the lower corner, there is a treasure horse bringing in uh, a huge ingot. The treasure basin at Shen Wan Shan's uh, foot can be likened to the incense burner placed on the altar in front of, for instance, a Buddhist deity. The two side figures are labeled on the left, Yuan Zilan, and on the right, Kang Baiwan. Yuan is said to have been from Shandong uh, province, but I really can't find out anything very specific about him. The text at the top is blurred in some places, but it simply gives the names of these three living wealth gods. Now, Yuan may be uh, impossible to identify, but Kang is very well known. Here. Um, Kang Baiwan is millionaire Kang, and it refers to the famous Kang family about whom much is known. From the late Ming Dynasty until the early 20th century, the Kangs maintained a productive agricultural and trading empire. They constructed a vast, complex estate in Gongshan in Henan province preserved today as, quote, the largest complex of cliffside underground rooms known as uh, Yao Dong, above ground structures and courtyards in northern China. It is said that in 1901, the Empress Dowager Cixi claimed the Kong family as Bai Wan, millionaires. So another example. Uh, this is uh, a picture of Hu Guangyong. He's pictured in a print probably from Shanghai are now in the library of Soez in London. It's titled, The Qing Dynasty Living Wealth God Opens the Assembled Beauties Hall. Seated in the center of the picture in front of a uh, decorative folding screen, the corpulent Hu, wearing a fur jacket, enjoys the company of eight female musicians and singers. They all have labels next to them. They come from Suzhou, Yangzhou, Shanghai, Hangzhou, Manchuria, Guangdong, Europe, and Japan. His assistant, uh, Wei Ado, is also pictured, and an attendant kneels in front, bringing a platter of ingots. The woman from Manchuria over here has natural-sized feet and wears shoes raised on a small platform that was habitual among Manchu women. This is one of my favorite images here. This is a Westerner with red hair. So we have a red-headed uh, foreigner. She's from the West. She's seated on a Western-style chair. And she wears the latest Western layered flounced skirt and tight bodice. Her trimmed hat is enhanced, is enhanced with flowers. And she plays a concertina. Now, who was a famous merchant banker who negotiated uh, many loans to Chinese from foreign firms? According to Wellington K. K. Chan, who, quote, emerged from obscurity to become probably the wealthiest man in the lower Yangtze area, end quote. However, he was also noted for his dissolute lifestyle. It is said he had 30 concubines and 300, 130, 130 maids. 
The print, as far as I can tell, interpreting a Hu Guangyong is largely fictional. In the fantasy portrayal in the print, he is surrounded not by coins and money trees, but by beautiful women from near and far. The location of the assembled beauties hall remains to be determined. Whether Hu actually had women musicians in his household from the West and from Japan is unknown. Furthermore, a portrait of Hu, and I'm not sure whether this is a photograph or a painting, it looks like an ancestor portrait, shows him with a thin face and sunken cheeks, bearing little resemblance to uh, his appearance in the print. So it is my feeling uh, that this print uh, is probably not meant to represent reality, but rather how who might appear in the public imagination by celebrating his foreign contacts and his reputation as a high-living multi-millionaire. It is also a tribute to Shanghai's cosmopolitan and international commercial status in the late 19th century. Now, up to this point, most of the images of the actual uh, living wealth gods rely heavily on magical uh, intervention, legend, hearsay, and gossip, rather than on historical accuracy. And we find a more realistic situation taking place uh, in, that appeared in the 1940s. The concept of a living wealth god did not disappear in the 20th century, but paradoxically was briefly espoused by the communists in Yan'an in 1943. The communists, in their push for economic stability in the face of the nationalist boycotts, launched a label, labor hero or role model campaign in April 1942, headlining it as the Emulate uh, Wu Manuo campaign. This morphed into the great production movement of 1943. In the, 19, in the fall of 1943, some 180 labor heroes from all walks of life, agricultural, industrial, military, cultural, transportation, were brought to Yan'an where they were fatted. The most famous was Wu Manuo. Wu Manuo was the first to create or start a labor brigade in 1939. He and his neighbors demonstrated that collective effort was more efficient than working alone. He was able to cultivate three times as much land and raise three times as many crops as the average farmer. Uh, he by 1944, had a farm, 40 sheep and goats, four oxen, one horse, four beehives, and endless chickens. In a throwback to old China, he was said to be a living wealth god. In this pithy print, designed by Gu Yuan, 1919 to 1996, in 1943, the sturdy Yan'an hero Wu Manyo appears wearing peasant garb, a sheepskin coat, a hat with ear flaps, his purple trousers are held up with a red sash. So in contrast to the older living wealth got, such as Shen Wanshan, the wealth that Wu acquired is expressed not in coins, money or jewels or beautiful women, but grains and animals, including an ox, horse, mule, ducks, and chickens. Then as a postscript, uh, Christian Dupi asked me, do the Chinese still like or favor a wealth god? And the answer is, oh yes. Appreciation of a living wealth god continues today. One only needs to realize that the Chinese capitalized on Shen Wanshan's storied wealth by refurbishing his 18th century family mansion in his hometown in Suzhou. To further enhance uh, tourist trade, a huge statue of Shen was placed in a prominent location on the grounds. For more evidence, uh, in 1990, there was an extensive restoration of the Kang mansion in Gongxian and it included a room for displaying modern reproductions of the earlier print depicting the three wealth gods. In 2001, this residence was designated as a national protected historical site. And finally, in the 1880s, Xi Jinping, born in 1953, was then the vice mayor of the city of Xiamen, and he built a very successful theme park so successful that he was nicknamed a living god of wealth. He went on to become China's vice president. He was recently appointed uh, vice chairman of the Central Military Commission, and he is regarded as the successor to the current president. So here we have the president of China being, at one point in his life, a living wealth god. To the best of my knowledge, no woodblock print or other picture, like a painting, 
depicts Xi in his role as a living wealth god. However, we do have a photograph of him, and perhaps his wealth is reflected in his rotund face, suggesting a good life with plenty of food. So the custom of having a special designation of living god of wealth lives on. But the tradition of specifically depicting such an individual as a living wealth god is defunct. But who knows? The Chinese might still come up with a print or a painting of some living wealth god. Thank you.